let you instantly search across the apps and services you love. So you can kick back and stream in 4K Ultra HD with 12 months of Peacock Premium at no extra cost. Hisense X-Class TV, welcome to your joy. Available now, only at Walmart. USAA is made for the safe pilots. For that, who can come to a stop with barely a bomb? Lucia, who announces her intentions, even if no one's there. And Sergeant Moore, who leaves room for her room with USAA safe pilot when you drive safe, you can save up to 30% on your auto insurance. Get a quote and start saving. USAA, what you're made of, we're made for. I was a doubting Thomas because we had tried other programs to help him learn and he was bored. It wasn't working. And one day I came home, Kai was on the computer and they were doing abcmouse.com. He lit up ABC Mouse Makes Learning Fun. There's math, puzzles, so many books, loads of educational games. I know the future is brighter because he's excited about learning. He wants to learn. And I know that's because of abcmouse.com. DS9, all alliance ships. Terran Empire fleet is attacking the station. We require immediate assistance. But the mysteries do not end there. Our moon has been placed precisely in the orbit it travels. There is no way it could obtain its orbit randomly. Our moon is the only moon in the solar system that has a stationary near perfect circular orbit stranger still the moon's center of mass is about six thousand feet closer to the earth than its geometric center which should cause wobble but the moon's bulge is on the far side of the moon away from the earth it seems that something must have put the moon in orbit with its precise altitude course and speed. The odds of any of these factors randomly happening is zero. It's like if you go in, get in the pot, you really get into uh, physics, biology. And How does one that? explain the coincidence that the moon is just the uh, right distance coupled with uh, just the right diameter to completely so cover the sun? During that eclipse, again, Isaac Asimov explains that there is no astronomical reason why the moon and the sun should fit so well. It is the sheerest of coincidences, and only the Earth among all the planets is blessed in this fashion. Most people think the moon is just a moon, but there is some talk that it should actually be classified as a planet. For one, it's far too big to be a true moon. Being about one-fourth of the diameter of Earth, it's easily the biggest moon in relation to its planet in our solar system. Because of its large size, the moon doesn't actually orbit Earth at all. Instead, Earth and Moon orbit each other around a point between them. Yep. This point is called a very center. And the illusion the Moon is actually orbiting Earth comes from the fact that the very center is currently located inside the Earth's crust. The fact that the very center remains inside the Earth is pretty much the only reason Earth and Moon aren't classified as a twin planet instead of a planet and its satellite. However, this may change in the future. The moon could end up being classified as the wind. There is scientific debate for that right now. Because of its size and relation to Earth. I mean, Jupiter's got moons bigger than ours. But once you consider all the sites we know about this, millions of times bigger than any of their moons, you know. The moon is not 
more ever has been. Earth's natural satellite. Now, I'm not sure of the uh, actual significance of it, but the fact that our moon can actually eclipse the sun's glow is phenomenal too because no other moon that we have discovered can do that. The ancient I'm not sure why that's going to knock it. I can only get a tenth of a time when it our moon it. wasn't there. Yep. Theories about the moon actually date back thousands of years as various cultures and civilizations discuss the story of how it came to be where it resides today. Greek authors Aristotle, Plutarch, as well as Roman authors Agonius, Rhodius, and Ovid all wrote of a group of people called the Proselytes, who lived in the central mountainous area of Greece called Arcadia. The Proselytes claimed title to this area because their forebears were there before oh, there was a moon in the heavens. Now, this claim is substantiated by symbols on the wall of the courtyard of Kalesasia, near the city of Tianakaya, Bolivia, whose symbols record that the moon came into orbit around the Earth between 11,500 and 13,000 years ago, long before recorded history. African Zulu legends say the moon is hollow and the home of the Python or Chichiria, a reptilian race of intelligent extraterrestrials. The legend states the moon was brought here hundreds of generations ago by two brothers, Waywan and Panku, who were the leaders of these reptilian extraterrestrials. <sighs> these two reptiles were known as the Water Brothers, and they both had scaly skin like a fish. <laughs> the Zulu tell is very similar to the Mesopotamia and Sumerian accounts about the two chief leaders who were also brothers Enlil and Enoch, lords of the earth. The Zulu legend tells of how Gawain and Penku stole the moon in the form of an egg from the giant fire dragon and emptied out the yolk until it was hollow. Then they rolled the moon across the sky and brought about cataclysmic events on the planet that ended the golden age of the past. This legend fits well into the theory of oh. those reptilian human hybrids, which are thought to run our world the today. Things that happen after the moon. Credo Mutwa, a Sulu shaman, claims that the Earth was very different then than it is now, before the moon had arrived. There weren't any seasons, and the planet was perpetually engulfed by a canopy of water vapor. People did not feel the strong glare of the sun that we do now, and they could only see it through a watery mist. The earth was once a beautiful place, a lovely place, lush and green, with giant redwoods, violets, and ferns, with a gentle drizzle of mist. The water canopy fell to the earth as a cataclysm of rain. And the moon was put into place in the earth's oh, orbit. Great. This could explain the Noah story in the Bible when it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. The arrival of the moon, along with the reptilians, changed everything on earth. The moon modified the earth's rotation and angle. The earth turned on its axis as we were upside down, as the legend says, and brought more powerful tidal systems that once had been much calmer. The Zulu also claimed that women did not menstruate before the moon arrived. How could the Zulu, an ancient African tribe, know of the complex gravitational effects the moon has and would have on the earth? 
Much of our current knowledge of the moon was discovered in the last century. Zulus and other native African accounts say the moon was built far, far away to keep an eye on people and as a vehicle to travel the universe. The Zulus say that the reptilians black people mothership is the moon, and that's where they escaped to during the cataclysms of the Great Flood, which they themselves had caused by manipulating the orbit of the moon and creating other cosmic events. Very most people will talk about, of course, got more legend than most people will talk about because of the racism and why these spacecraft may might first appear. You know what I'm saying? Consider how this is something wrong. You'd be like saying, like, oh, you mean like the planet was all run by a nigga and spoiled by the white man? Yeah, man, that's what I'm saying. So, if you put your ass man now, you got fucking spring, summer, winter, and fall instead of perpetual motherfucking spring when you get the rain down every motherfucking day. You provide all this. Yeah, but now my woman has a period. Sorry about that, man. We didn't know that was going to happen. My bad. <laughs> but look at all the rest, but Just think of all the rest. Yeah, but now all you white people control the planet. Yeah, see how we improve it? We fought through some stuff that did say to the planet. I mean... You don't have to believe it, but it's like, wow, what an interesting, I mean, there's, I mean, there is so much, shit, I mean, shit about it, it's like, the water canopy fell to the earth, and it has to be looked at seriously, you know what I mean? You really have to look at it. And you know, we are not into science. I'm not a fucking conspiracy guy. I mean, there's some of it that's, I mean, I'm not, I don't think the reptilians, I think it was people. Oh, if it's reptilians, I'm thinking the dinosaurs, man. The moon modified the Earth's rotation and angle. Because uh, remember the that Star Trek episode. Uh, uh, oh, Gorn? No, not the Gorn, not just the Gorn, but the fucking box. Oh, yeah. I know, I know you didn't uh, freaking watch that one for Voyager, but when Voyager went ahead and the fucking, uh, the Delta Quadrant, they found the fucking box, which are bipedal freaking, uh, yeah. Duckbill dinosaur. Much of our current knowledge of the moon was forgot about that. I forgot about that. But yes, fuck the moon. Fucking uh say the moon was built far, far over. The fucking uh Peter Roddenberry was a big old believing her and all the ancient astronaut shit. I watched a couple of really cool, um, the one was a documentary series on fucking house, on Star Trek and shit like that, all about it and everything. The whole, from the beginning all the way until, um, Star Trek, uh, Enterprise. Uh, and Deep, they talked about how Gene Roddenberry, before he even started really working on the script for Star Trek, Met with uh, Eric Von Daniken, who, who wrote Chariots of Gods, the first book about how ancient aliens were here. And he, talk, he met with them and they talked about all the different theories and all the different ancient alien stuff that he wants to put into the, uh, the series Star Trek. And it was kept in it all the way through. If you, I mean, if you watch the, uh, the second, the next generation, the, the, um, the pattern from the top of the cosmic egg has, is on the walls in the hospital bay, which they thought, they, they say the cosmic egg is what brought 
DNA to the planet, the DNA is what made humans. You know, there's all kinds of different theories on how we got here, but all these different apes and alien spirits were all used in throughout the uh, Star Trek shit, if you watch it. And then there's even uh, an episode where they go to a planet and they meet all kinds of different, the type, different aliens and they're all humanoids. You know what I mean? Yeah, they could find out, um, <coughs> it's a race where, oh, we built our image, uh, you, uh, we built our image off of you, and then pretty much, uh, we spreaded our ashes all around the world. Yeah. That's it. That's the one. To keep an eye on people, and as a vehicle to travel the universe, the Zulus say that the reptilians' giant mothership is the moon, and that's where they escaped to during the cataclysms of the Great Flood, which they themselves had caused by manipulating the orbit of the moon and creating other cosmic events. Outrageous as the spacecraft moon theory might first appear, consider how this model reconciles all the mysteries of the moon. First, it explains why the moon gives evidence of being older than the Earth, and perhaps even our solar system, and why there are three distinct layers within the moon's crust, mm. with the densest material on the outside layer as one would expect if it's the hull of a spacecraft. Second, it could also explain why little to no water has been found on the moon's surface, yet there is evidence it exists deep inside. Mm. This theory could also explain the strange Maria and Maskins, perhaps the remnants of the machinery used to hollow out the moon. The idea of an artificial satellite could explain the odd rhythmic moon quakes as artificial constructs give way or collapse, reacting the same way during periods of stress from the Earth's pull. And artificial equipment beneath the moon's surface could be the source of the gas clouds that have been observed. <laughs> If we know the moon is not natural, or at least is a natural satellite that was hollowed to become a spaceship, are there any indications on the surface of the moon that would support this? The answer to this question may startle you. There are a plethora of strange sightings and phenomena on the surface of the moon, many of which you can see with a decent telescope or even the naked eye. Even with these nuts? <laughs> Aristocris, Plato, Aristides, Bila, Rabbi Levi, and Poseidonus all reported anomalous lights on the moon. Even NASA, one year before the first lunar landing, reported 570 plus lights and flashes that were observed on the moon from 1540 to 1967. As recent as 2014, sightings of lights seen on the moon continue to be reported. Seeing lights on the moon is actually quite common. However, the anomalies don't stop there. A multitude of photographs taken well, by the as well as NASA pretty much show probably several on the moon strange right now, mechanical uh, type devices on the surface like, um, Hey, the moon. motherfuckers, we're here. Yeah. Um, the shard, an obelisk shaped object that towers one and a half miles from the Euclid area of the moon's surface, 
that was discovered by Orbiter 3 in 1968. Dr. Bruce Cornett, who studied the amazing photographs, stated no known natural process can explain such a structure. <laughs> The tower, one of the yeah, most okay. curious features ever photographed by the lunar <laughs> surface, is an amazing spire that rises more than five miles from the Simpsonian region of the lunar surface. I'm probably sure every woman in there, uh, the right mind would be more. like, um, unusual uh, structures uh, uh, have been discovered. Do I want to have my vagina be sucked uh, uh, down on that pole? <laughs> I'm going to ride that thing till it's like even ship fried right. On the moon. Other strange lunar phenomena include the observation by Dr. Frank Harris of a black body on the surface 250 miles long and 50 miles wide, clouds and lightning, strange moving shadows and objects, and spire-like structures thousands of feet high. A huge boulder with tracks behind it from inside a crater to the rim, running uphill. <laughs> the shrinking over a period of time of the crater Luna from six miles in diameter to one and a half miles. Hill <laughs> effects in craters appearing and disappearing in a few hours. Over 800 substantial oh, observations man, have been here, made man. by scientists get out of, here, of man. blinking and flashing lights. The results of NASA photographs of the lunar surface indicating several large pyramid structures. Strange rips in the surface with entrances, massive girders, machinery, and some 1,000 kilometer blocks of metal alongside tears in the surface. Mm -hmm. Scientific experts, including NASA investigators, believe that the moon is hollow. It is the only explanation. The velocity of sound has been found to increase with depth and at 40 miles, it is too fast for the speed of propagation through rock substance. I can't even. One day, maybe, <coughs> but not right now. Please, let this be the time. Maybe. We've been trying right for so long. Uh, 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 no matter uh, uh, what uh, result uh, you're hoping uh, uh, for, when you need to be sure, choose Clear Blue Digital, a unique combination of AeroGuard features and over 99% accurate. Clear Blue, for results you can trust. Man, I slept. Oh, oh, we gave honey, it sequel piercing, it's positive. We're going to have a baby. Tired of being tired. I've never oh. slept like this before. I've never woken up like this before. I feel like doing things. And then doing other things after those things. It's hard to explain. I'm just back. Crafted with clinically studied plant-based ingredients that work naturally with your body. I feel really good. For restorative sleep like never before. My name is Megan Hinson. I've been teaching for seven years, and all those years I've been teaching first grade. ABC Mouse is such a good resource. This year, my scores have continued to increase. Something different is going on, and I have to attribute that to ABC Mouse. I should tell parents, you have got to use ABC Mouse at home. It truly works. With your help, with the teacher's help, and with ABC Mouse's help, they're able to reach higher levels than they ever thought that they could. One Prilosec OTC in the morning blocks heartburn all day and all night. Prilosec OTC prevents excess acid production that can cause heartburn. So don't fight heartburn. Block it with Prilosec OTC. Go to Fox Weather app. So much more than a forecast. Lightning fast. Cutting edge. 
and best of all, tailored to your location and your needs. Fox Weather, download the app now and make it your own. NASA is a government agency, and all government agencies are known to have a history of concealing information from the general public. Questioning NASA's story isn't ludicrous. Many speculate that NASA discovered unsettling information when they finally visited the moon decades ago. Information that would have caused them a lot of problems if leaked to the public. Therefore, we have never returned any human missions to the moon since. Any suggestion of the moon not being what we've been told it is usually follows with accusations of conspiracy theory and pseudoscience. Although there may be many theories that aim to debunk all the aspects of this information, there are too many factors that still don't add up. How is it that seemingly unconnected ancient cultures have their own version of the artificial moon myth? Why are there unexplained geometric structures on the surface of the moon which correlate to the structures found in ancient Egypt and other primitive locations on Earth? How is it that by miraculous chance, the moon perfectly eclipses our sun? The mathematical random probability that the sun and moon would perfectly align for a total eclipse to appear on Earth is zero. And yet the moon has perfectly timed phases and does eclipse often. The distance of the sun to the moon and the moon to the earth, moon, which allows for the synchronized and complete coverage of the disk of the sun, is impossible. Uh, uh, yes, the moon replaced I mean, precisely the moon, where it is. Sometimes the moon and the planet Earth will get in front of uh, the sun, and you won't be able to see the moon. That's how it goes into, like, you know, from from full to small to gone, and because the planet moves in the front of the sun, so the moon doesn't shine. 1969 and, 1972, and then Apollo ends up doing the other thing, the moon will the sun, the and the sun doesn't shine. 14, 15, and 16 instruments faithfully radioed data back to Earth until they were switched off in 1977. Between 1972 and 1977, the Apollo Seismic Network saw 28 moon quakes. A few registered up to 5.5 on the Richter scale. A magnitude 5 quake on Earth is energetic enough to move heavy furniture and crack plaster. Furthermore, Shallow moon quakes lasted a remarkably long time. Once they reached residence, all continued for more than 10 minutes. Neil Armstrong was quoted as saying, the moon was ringing like a bell. What causes the shallow moon quakes and where do they occur? No one knows for sure. The Apollo seismometers were all in one relatively small region on the front side of the moon. So NASA was unable to pinpoint the exact locations of the quakes. It has been established beyond all reasonable doubt that the moon is not what it appears to be. Two Soviet scientists, Mikhail Vasin and Alexander Shubrakov, have spent much of their careers examining the facts compiled on lunar phenomena. Their conclusion is that the moon is artificial, 
possibly a hollowed out planetoid, and that it was steered from some distant region of the galaxy into a circular orbit around our planet. And hence the extraordinary mystery of the rock and moon dust age variations. They claim that intellectual life has existed in the moon for eons. Spaceship Moon is the brainchild of two Soviet researchers, but many others agree with the theory, including NASA scientists at JPL and an Oxford University physicist. Well, they the won't be using theory any of those now returned, pads anymore. But with a significant no. adjustment, and that is that the moon was steered into orbit by some intelligence. Everything now is all SpaceX. Yeah. During one of the Apollo moon landings, several television viewers wrote to NASA explaining that they spotted one of the astronauts pick up what appeared to be a glass bottle and remark, my God, I don't believe it. Look at this. Then the television screen went blank. If true, this suggests a government cover-up. Other viewers observed the extreme difficulty astronauts had when drilling down a few inches into the moon's surface, and that when the drill bit was pulled out, metal shavings were visible. Rocks were found to contain brass, mica, titanium, and elements uranium-236 and neptunium-237, not previously found in nature. Astronomers have reported the sighting of a 12-mile-long bridge-like structure over the Sea of Crisis. This report was published in 1954 by John O'Neill, and in the 1950s, astronomer Morris K. Jessup claimed that UFOs had bases on the moon, and so does the government. Why was the moon directed to retain continuously a dark side, a side of the moon we never see? The two sides of the moon have evolved differently since their formation, with the far side forming at cooler temperatures and remaining stiffer, while the Earth side has been modified at high temperatures and for longer. Which would account for traveling forward in space. Why the difference? Perhaps one side was exposed to more forward pressure during flight? The moon is tidally locked to Earth, meaning only one hemisphere faces us. We know that side well, with its dark regions called maria, or seas of cooled magma. Oddly, however, these maria are virtually absent from the back side of the moon, as has been revealed to us by probes and even seen in person by Apollo 8 astronauts. The proverbial dark side of the moon also is much more pockmarked by craters. The starkly different hemispheres have been partly explained by the far side having a crust roughly nine miles thicker than that of the near side. Astronauts found it extremely difficult to drill into the surface of these dark plain-like areas. Soil samples were loaded with rare metals and elements. But this dumbfounded scientists because these elements require tremendous heat approximately 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit to melt and fuse with the surrounding rock. Samples brought back to Earth by both Soviet and American space probes contain pure iron particles. The Soviets announced that pure iron particles brought back by remote controlled lunar probe Zond-20 have not oxidized 
even after several years on Earth. Pure iron particles that do not rust are unheard of in the scientific world. Although there is a solid iron pillar of unknown age in New Delhi, India, that has never rusted, and no one knows why. Surprising dangers is lunar dust. As everyone knows, sand gets into everywhere, even on Earth. But on the moon, it's very hazardous. Lunar dust is as fine as flour, yet extremely rough. Thanks to this texture and the moon's low gravity, it clings absolutely everywhere. NASA has experienced numerous problems caused by moon dust. It has eroded astronauts' boots almost completely through and sandpapered their visors. It has traveled inside the ships with the spacesuits and caused moon hay fever in the poor astronauts that have inhaled it. It's thought that prolonged exposure to the stuff could even cause airlocks to fail and spacesuits to break down. And in case you were wondering, yes, of course, this devilish substance smells like gunpowder. Lunar <laughs> explorations have revealed that much of the moon's surface is covered with a glassy glaze, which indicates that the moon's surface has been scorched by an unknown source of intense heat. As one scientist put it, the moon is paved with glass. The expert analysis shows that this did not result from massive meteor impacts. Could the presence of a glassy surface indicate the moon traveled at such high speeds, not unlike a spacecraft near light speed, that the surface friction resulted in the moon's high level of radiation and glass-like surface? The upper eight miles of the moon's crust are surprisingly radioactive. When Apollo 15 astronauts used their thermal equipment they got unusually high readings, which indicated that the heat flow near the Apennine Mountains was extremely hot. In fact, one lunar expert confessed, when we saw that, we said, my God, this place is about to melt. The core must be very hot. But that is the puzzle. The core is not hot at all, but cold which only fits if the moon is hollow. The amount of radioactive material on the surface is not only embarrassingly high, but difficult to account for. Where did all this hot radioactive material come from? And if it came from the interior of the moon, how did it get to the surface? Is it possible that extraterrestrials are still living on or within the moon? Since the Apollo 11 moon mission, rumors have floated around NASA of an incident that was censored by the government. The incident involved NASA astronaut Neil Armstrong reporting to have seen UFO spacecraft on the leading edge of a crater on the moon. There is a documented but unconfirmed report that when Buzz Aldrin opened the door after landing on the moon, he immediately saw a transparent ethereal being staring at him from outside. Hmm. Oh. 
possible. Allegedly, the NASA Houston flight director has said that there was a public and secret private ASA radio frequency between the moon lander and mission control, and that a conversation took place during a mysterious two-minute interruption in public transmissions. To prove it is true, Hundreds of independent civilian radio operators with powerful VHF equipment separately reported hearing the AMA spaceship report from the Apollo moon walkers. Soviet radio operators also picked up and published it in Moscow. Another mysterious radio message from the moon was broadcast on French public television only one time before it was censored after it leaked out. That transmission appeared to be a mysterious, clearly spoken alien language. The famous French historian and author Robert Chirot published the transmission, which has been suppressed in the United States. It came from a U.S. astronaut warden who transmitted it to NASA, and expert linguists have been unable to translate the message. Then there are the images. For decades, observers on Earth and probes sent to the moon, as well as the astronauts themselves, have produced photographs that appear to show very strange anomalies on the moon. Images of structures on the moon have cropped up since the invention of space photography. What are these structures? Who built them? Are they leftover artifacts from some ancient culture? Are currently operating facilities still active on the moon today? Many of these structures emit lights or appear to move. Some are impossibly large, while others leave tracks across the moon's surface. And why is it that no one in an official capacity will admit the obvious when asked about these anomalies? The case of fear, the case of panic. Yeah. Is the human race ready for existence with another corporeal being? Uh, probably not. No. one of the closest yet most mysterious objects in the night sky. Even though we have been there five times, we still know very little about it, and much of its strange oddities are kept secret for reasons unknown. Probes sent to the moon in the last decade have revealed the presence of water on the moon, but no one knows where it came from. Recently, the Chinese launched and landed a probe on the moon. Perhaps they will reveal what the United States will not. As outrageous as the moon spaceship theory is, all of the mysteries of the moon are resolved if one accepts that the moon is a gigantic extraterrestrial craft.
brought here eons ago by intelligent beings. This is the only theory that is supported by all of the data, and there is no data that contradicts this theory. The moon is a hollow sphere that apparently has traveled throughout the galaxy and resides now in a perfect orbit around Earth. Who brought it here? One popular theory is that a race called the Anunnaki came to Earth centuries ago and created the human race. According to the theory, the Sumerians are descendants of that race. Others believe the moon may have brought mankind itself, who populated one or both of the islands of Lemur and Atlantis. After both islands sank, these people were scattered around the earth and now make up the different races we are now. Let's consider a fictional hypothesis that may explain all the anomalies about the moon. Eons ago, a space-bearing race of humans hollowed out a moon in their solar system and converted it into a spaceship. The hollowed out areas would contain provisions and housing for thousands of humans, plus equipment to begin a colony. This moon was blasted out of orbit and traveled perhaps as a generation ship until it arrived at our inviting blue earth. We can only speculate why they came, but they arrived and parked their moon in a perfect orbit around the earth. Perhaps they wanted to terraform the earth and place the moon in such a precise orbit as to create weather patterns much like their own world. Once here, they began to set up their civilization, perhaps on the mirror or Atlantis or both. Using the technology they brought with them and what they could salvage from the moon, they built a new colony here on Earth. When the island of Lemur or Atlantis sank, they lost all their technology and scattered around the planet, becoming the races we know now. The red race would populate North America. The white race went north to become the Vikings. The black race escaped to Africa, and the Oriental race ended up in Asia. For the brief time they were here, and had access to their moon-brought technology, they may have built monuments that survive to this day. During the time their colony prospered, they may have had the ability to return to the moon and leave technology on the surface 
or even within the moon. Systems may have been abandoned that still operate to this day. Perhaps a great flood engulfed their colony and erased much of what they brought with them. Or the sinking of the landmass they settled on destroyed all they had brought with them. In any case, after these disasters, they would retain what knowledge they had, but all their technological equipment would be gone, and they had no way to return to the ship that brought them here. History as we know it began after these events. <laughs> we do not know who brought the moon here, but it is here now. And it is a constant reminder of the unusual characteristics it embodies. The dark side of the moon is always hidden to our eyes and telescopes on Earth. An obviously perfect vantage point for aliens to construct secret hidden spaceports. The lack of atmosphere is no problem to enclosed domes with artificial environments which even NASA admits our scientists already have the technology. What they won't admit publicly is the existence of structures on the moon and the lunar extraterrestrial activity. One of the most compelling witness accounts of structures on the moon came from a man who worked for the Director of Intelligence at Langley in Virginia. Carl Wolf was one of only two technicians at Langley with high enough security clearance to work with a high-tech photographic equipment which processed info from U-2 spy planes and other military intelligence hardware. At the time, Langley was the center for receiving information from the Lunar Orbiter Project, a satellite sent to the moon specifically for reconnaissance and to take images of the far side of the moon. This was for the military, who knew at the time there were structures on the moon. Wolf surfaced 30 years later to reveal he was sent to repair NSA photographic equipment that failed. While there, he engaged in conversation with an attendant in the dark room. About 30 minutes into the process, the attendant said to Wolf in a very distressed manner, By the way, we've discovered a base on the back side of the moon. He then proceeded to put down photographs in front of Wolf, which clearly displayed structures, mushroom-shaped buildings, spherical buildings, and towers. He could clearly make out geometric shapes, well-organized and well-designed. Most notable to Wolf were what looked exactly like radar antennas, very similar to what one would find on Earth. There was no doubt now in Wolf's mind why the diverse array of scientists and investigators were in attendance on that day. They had arrived to see and study what he was looking at, structures made by intelligent beings on the moon. Over the ensuing days, Wolf was certain that the news of the moon structures would be announced to the world, but it never happened. Wolf was now certain that he had to remain silent or his life would be in danger. The year that Wolf saw the remarkable structures on the dark side of the moon was 1965, four years before Neil Armstrong put the first footprint on the lunar surface. Former CIA pilot John Lear in an interview stated that 250 million humanoid aliens live on the moon. He also stated that beneath the surface of the moon are urban areas where gray aliens live. There are laboratories in the underground facilities where genetic experiments are carried out. NASA published photographs taken by Apollo 8, 10, and 11 to prevent certain secrets of the moon from being revealed. These photographs were in 1971 in the NASA book SB2-46. Despite the editing of the images, it is still possible to see a city, a space base, pipes, roads, vegetation, air, and atmosphere. According to Lear, all we know about the moon is a sham government with the specific purpose of hiding its extraterrestrial activities and programs. I cannot prove it, 
Lear stated, or I would already be dead. JC tried game flings for the first time the other day. The scent made quite an impression. It was like that tower and JC were the only two left on Earth. But they weren't. You can always spot a first timer. Game flings with Oxy Booster for Breeze. Seriously good scent. Float away with Spring Daydream from Game. What if positive change was only on one design plane? Some say design is beyond most people's reach. You say it's already in your hands. So, what will you design today? Man, drive time makes it easier to buy a car. You can pretty much do it all on your phone and your own time. I got approved, found tons of cars that I like, and got my personalized financing right here. It's kind of like I'm already at a dealership. Hey, yeah. You are in a drive time dealership. Hey. Cool. How? Oh, yeah. Technically, anywhere you are with your phone, you're pretty much in a drive time dealership. Oh, right, because I can basically do it all on my phone. Correct. Get your down payment, monthly payment, and find the car you need all on your phone. <laughs> Is your bathroom stuck in an endless cycle of flush stink revolving? Wow. You better get for brief small spaces. Press firmly to activate. An unlike the leading phone, small spaces continuously eliminates odor, preventing that endless odor what? cycle for up to 45 days. That's freshness you'll want in every small room. Closets? Yep. Kids' rooms? Good idea. Even when her bathroom is also your laundry room. Prevent odors with Febreze Small Spaces. Febreze. <laughs> Homeowners, refinancing your mortgage can mean big savings, but beware the bait and switch loan. Other sites may offer you low rates that you don't end up qualifying for. At Credible.com, you can compare actual pre-qualified rates from multiple lenders tailored to your situation. Our average customer saves over $3,000 a year. Hurry, rates could rise. Lock in your low rate. Visit Credible.com. It was during the 1950s that many UFOs seen over Earth were tracked back to the moon by government tracking stations in secret complexes in the deserts of Arizona and Nevada inside underground mountain bases. During this time, officials obtained a photo of a saucer-shaped craft hovering over the moon taken by a civilian astronomer, Sergeant Willard Winnell who investigated UFO landings in Ohio while in Army Intelligence, described the 8x10 detailed photo of a silvery spaceship hovering directly over a huge moon landscape, estimated to be several miles long. Soviet and American spacecraft in orbit over the moon began to photograph mysterious structures on the moon, which were censored by NASA, but soon obtained by scientific researchers like Fred Streckley, who demanded the evidence from this so-called civilian agency. NASA eventually released the photos without comment. Many of the structures can only be seen when these photos are blown up to a much larger size. The United States spacecraft Ranger 2 took over 200 photographs of the moon's craters with domes inside. They were reported in the news media by French astronomers about 48 years earlier. 33 moon dome photos from the Lunar Orbiter 2 were released without comment in Washington, D.C in 1967. On June the 1st of 1966, NASA had admitted to the news media that astronauts had seen UFOs, then later contradicted the shocking statement by denying it. During the Apollo 11 landing, hundreds of independent civilian radio operators with powerful VHF equipment separately reported hearing startling observations from the Apollo moonwalkers, such as breach has either flowed into these structures before they were built, or the domes are younger than the floor. The area is over or elliptical. 
So what were these domes and structures that the astronauts observed? Apollo radio public broadcasts from the moon also use the terms and phrases flashes of light, buildings, roads, tracks, and huge blocks. When news reporters asked space program officials what these terms were all about, they were told that they were metaphors for geological formations. However, scientist Fortin Bez, who taught geology to the astronauts, admitted that he was totally baffled by these terms. Bez admitted the clincher when he said, not every discovery has been announced. When news reporters asked him about the flashes of light, Bez replied, there is no question about it, not natural. The Apollo encounter was common knowledge in NASA, but nobody has talked about it until now. He continued with, all Apollo and Gemini flights were followed, both at a distance, sometimes also quite close, by space vehicles of extraterrestrial origin. Every time it occurred, the astronauts informed Mission Control, who then ordered absolute silence. Chaplin also stated, I think that Walter Shearer aboard Mercury 8 was the first of the astronauts to use the code name Santa Claus to indicate the presence of flying saucers next to space capsules. However, his announcements were rarely noticed by the general public. It was different when James Lovell on board the Apollo 8 command module came out from behind the moon and said for everybody to hear, please be informed that there is a Santa Claus. Even though this happened on Christmas Day of 1968, many people sensed a hidden meaning to those words. The rumors persist to this day. NASA may well be a civilian agency, but many of its programs are funded by the defense budget, and most of the astronauts are subject to military security regulations. Apart from the fact that the NSA screens all films and radio communications as well, the astronauts were under strict orders not to discuss their silence. According to John Podesta, former chief of staff for Bill Clinton and counselor to Barack Obama, the truth about the moon is being kept hidden from the public. He stated, I'm skeptical about many things including the notion that government always knows best and that the people can't be trusted with the truth. The time to pull the curtain back on the alien presence on the moon subject is long overdue. We have statements from the most credible sources, those in a position to know about a fascinating phenomenon, the nature of which is yet to be determined. Dr. John Brandenburg, is the principal inventor of the microwave electrothermal plasma thruster, which uses water propellants for space propulsion. Brandenburg was involved in the Clementine mission to the moon, which was part of a joint space project between the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization and NASA. The mission discovered water at the moon's poles in 1994. He was the deputy manager of that mission. Brandenburg stated, the Clementine Project was a photo reconnaissance mission, basically to check out if someone was building bases on the moon that we didn't know about. Were they expanding them? It was during the Clementine mapping of the lunar surface that Brandenburg began to suspect an extraterrestrial presence on the moon. He said, as somebody in the space defense community, I look on any such structure on the moon with great concern because it isn't ours and there's no way we could have built such a thing. It means someone else is up there. Brandenburg is also quoted for saying, we were aware there was a possibility of an unknown presence, possibly alien extraterrestrial near the Earth. There I am sitting in a room of retired Army and Air Force generals and a few admirals, and we're watching what looks like a firefight in space. The most senior general there turned to me and said, Where do you think they're from? And I said, I don't know, sir. 
I've heard they're from 40 light years from here. Intelligent beings from other star systems have been and are visiting our planet Earth. They are variously referred to as visitors, others, star people, ETs, etc. They are visiting Earth now. This is not a matter of conjecture or wistful thinking. Is it possible that every time we look up at the moon, we are peering into our own past? We are seeing the vessel that transversed the vast emptiness of space and brought all mankind to Earth. Is the moon a spaceship? Could aliens reside in it now? Or is it an ancient starship with secrets of our past and even we humans ourselves? Or could it be an observation platform scrutinizing human endeavors as we grow and become a space-bearing race as well? Until we begin to take these curiosities about the moon seriously, we may never know who parked a starship in orbit around Earth. The next time you look up at the moon, ask yourself, why? for 13 years. This is my 17th year. Taught kindergarten for over 20 years. I have never seen a program like abcmouse.com. ABC Mouse has everything. It encompasses science, math, reading. Our test scores have gone up tremendously since we've begun ABC Mouse. Our scores are just amazing. But the best thing about abcmouse.com is that they're having fun. It helps kids love to learn.
Of all the mysteries in the world, nothing is more curious than man himself. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And how long have we been on Earth? We have examples of our growth on planet Earth throughout time, but some of these examples befuddle even us. When did we make these technological artifacts? How were they made? And in some cases, what was their purpose? In this program, we will explore several of these unique artifacts and explore the possible purpose and manufacturing of each. Is it possible we had help? Are we the greatest mystery of all time? with a mystery that has raised eyebrows for decades, but today has been proven to be a rather common item. The story of the Costco artifact has been embellished over the years, but all accounts have common elements. On February 13, 1961, Wallace Lane, Virginia Maxey, and Mike Mikesell were seeking interesting mineral specimens, particularly geodes, for their LMNV Rockhounds Gym and Gift Shop in California. The trio were about six miles northeast of Avalanche, near the top of a peak, about 4,300 feet in elevation, and about 340 feet above the dry bed of Owens Lake. At lunchtime, after collecting rocks most of the morning, all three placed their specimens in the rock sack Mike Sell was carrying. The next day in the gift shop's workroom, Mike Sell ruined a nearly new diamond saw blade while cutting what he thought was a geode. Inside the nodule that was cut, Mike Sell did not find a cavity as so many geodes have, but a perfectly circular section of very hard white material that appeared to be porcelain. In the center of the porcelain cylinder was a two millimeter shaft of bright metal. The metal shaft responded to a magnet. There were still other odd quantities about the specimen. The outer layer of the specimen was allegedly encrusted with bastard. fossil shells and their uh, fragments. In addition to shells, there were reports of two metallic metal objects in the crust resembling a nail and a washer. Stranger still, the inner layer was hexagonal and seemed to form a casing around the hard porcelain cylinder. Within the inner layer, a layer of decomposing copper allegedly surrounded the porcelain cylinder. The group had an anomaly. Here was a possible geode over 500,000 years old with some sort of electronic device buried within it. The object looked like a spark plug and no one could figure out how it came to be encased in a geode from thousands of years ago. A spark plug encased in 500,000 year old geode would represent a substantial scientific and historical anomaly as spark plugs were invented in the 19th century. Critics say that the stone matrix containing the artifact is not a geode but consecration that can be explained by natural processes that can take place over a decade or two. Had the group really found a piece of technology encased in a prehistoric stone from ages ago? In 2018, an investigation by Paris Stromberg and Paul Henrich, with the help of members of the Spark Plug Collectors of America, identified the artifact as a 1920s era champion spark plug widely used in the Ford Model T and Model A engines. SPCA President Chad Wyndham and other collectors concurred with his assessment. Stromberg and Hendrich's report indicates that the spark plug became encased in a concretion composed of iron derived from the rusting spark plug 
Iron and steel artifacts rapidly form iron oxide concretions as they rust in the ground. On April 12, 2018, Paris Stromberg was contacted by the family of one of the co-discoverers of the artifact. He was offered an opportunity to physically inspect the artifact, and he accepted, and also arranged for the artifact to be inspected by a geologist from the University of Washington Earth and Space Science Department. The inspections confirmed the previous conclusion that the artifact was a 1920s era champion spark plug. The Caso artifact is a good example of not jumping to conclusions when analyzing ancient artifacts. There could be a simple and reasonable explanation. However, some artifacts are not simple to explain and seemingly have no reasonable explanations. The Schist Disk is one of those unusual artifacts that defies explanation. It's been thought to be anything from an elaborate candle or incense holder to an impeller from some technological device. In January 1936, a strange disk was unearthed at the plateau edge of North Saqqara, approximately 1.7 kilometers north of Djoser's Steppe Pyramid in Egypt. The discovery of the mysterious prehistoric artifact that many considered as a device was made in the tomb of Prince Sabu around 3100 BC by a famous British Egyptologist, Walter Byron Emery. Sabu was the son of a high official or administrator of a town or province probably called Star of the Family of Horus. The unearthed device, named the Schist Disc, is approximately 24 inches by 4.2 inches in the center. It was manufactured by unknown means from very fragile and delicate material requiring very tedious carving the production of which would confound any craftsman today. Now many important questions arise. Scientists do not think the object is a wheel because the wheel appeared in Egypt at 1500 BC during the 18th dynasty. If the schist disc is in fact a wheel, it would mean ancient Egyptians possessed knowledge of the wheel about 3000 BC during the time of the first dynasty. This would require Egyptologists to rewrite some history books. If the schist disc is not a wheel, nor modeled after the wheel, what is it? Some scientists suggest that the fragile nature of such an intricately carved stone object greatly limits its practical usage and suggests a purely ornamental function, being of a religious or some other ritualistic purpose. Of course, some believe this disc served another purpose as a lamp. However, critics of the theory argue that the three-blade ceremonial lamp is hardly possible because of the shape and curvature of its petals, which seems to suggest a function, not just decoration. Egyptologist Cyril Aldrin reached the conclusion that, independently of what the object was used for or what it represented, its design was without a doubt a copy of a previous, more older, metallic object. Why did the ancient Egyptians bother to design an object with such a complex structure more than 5,000 years ago? How could a culture who typically used chisels to shape rock have mastered a technique to work such a delicate material into this extraordinary level? Obviously, the schist disc is an object that played an important role 5,000 years ago. Egyptologists offer a number of theories trying to explain what the disc was used for, but for the moment, no one has been able to explain the object's complex structure. The schist disc's futuristic design continues to baffle all those who have seen it. There is no doubt this particular object continues to constitute one of the most perplexing Egyptian and ancient mysteries, and we are left with several unanswered questions. You can examine the schist disc yourself, as it is currently in 
the Cairo Museum. In 1944, as a 10-year-old boy, Newton Anderson was fueling the coal furnace in his parents' home. He dropped a lump of coal onto the basement floor and it broke in half, revealing that it contained a bell inside. The coal that was mined near his house in Upshur County, West Virginia, is about 300 million years old. What is a brass bell with an iron clapper doing in coal ascribed to the Carboniferous period? According to Norm Schomburg's book, Ammunition, which includes several coal antidotes, the bell is an antediluvian artifact made before the Genesis flood. The Institute of Creation Research had the bell submitted to the lab at the University of Oklahoma. There, a nuclear activation analysis revealed that the bell contains an unusual mix of metals, different from any known modern alloy production including copper, zinc, tin, arsenic, iodine, and selenium. There is a winged statue at the top of the bell, which does not resemble any known cultural depiction. The closest depictions with similarities would be the Babylonian southwest wind demon called Pazuzu. There is a headpiece missing on the bell, which may have indicated the bell statue was taller. This is not the only artifact found in coal millions of years old. An iron pot was found in coal in Oklahoma. In a notarized statement, Frank Kennard said in 1948, he was working in the municipal electric plant in Thomas, Oklahoma in 1912. He came upon a solid chunk of coal, which was too large to use. He broke it up with a sledgehammer. The iron pot fell from the center, leaving the impression or mold of the pot in a piece of the coal. Jim Stahl, an employee of the company, witnessed the breaking of the coal and saw the pot fall out. He traced the source of the coal and found that it came from Will Burton, Oklahoma mines. A handful of other such artifact and coal accounts have been recorded by Ivan T. Sanderson, including an intricate gold chain found in coal. The Morrisonville, Illinois Times on June 11, 1891, published a report that Miss S.W. Culp found a circular-shaped 8-carat gold chain about 10 inches long embedded in a lump of coal after she broke it apart to put it in her scuttle. The chain was described as antique and of quaint workmanship. The story said only part of the chain was revealed when she first broke open the coal, and that the rest of the chain remained buried within the coal. The coal came from one of the southern Illinois mines. Unfortunately, the artifact has since disappeared. Objects that are millions of years old can only mean there was a civilization predating our modern culture. Who made these items eons ago? This question will probably never be answered. Suppose you came across a Roman dodecahedron. Would you know what it is, or what it was used for? This artifact is a small, hollow object made of bronze and stone, with a dodecahedron shape. Twelve flat pentagonal faces, each face having a circular hole of varying diameter in the middle. The holes connected to the hollow center. Roman dodecahedra date from the second or third centuries A.D. About a hundred of these objects have been found from Wales to Hungary and Spain, and to the east of Italy, and most found in Germany and France. Ranging from 4 to 11 centimeters in size, they also vary in terms of textures. Most are made of bronze, but some are made of stone. 
No mention of them has been found in contemporary accounts or pictures of the time. Speculated uses include a candlestick, as wax has been found inside two examples, dice, survey instruments for estimating distances to or distances of objects, devices for determining the optimal soap date for winter grain, gauges to calibrate water pipes or army standard bases. Use as a measuring instrument of any kind seems improbable, since the artifacts are not standardized and come in many sizes and arrangements of their openings. It has also been suggested that they may have been religious artifacts or even fortune-telling devices. This latter speculation is based on the fact that most of the examples have been found in hollow Roman sites. Several geodic tetra were found in coin boards, providing evidence that the owners considered them valuable objects. Smaller geodic tetra with the same features, holes and knobs, and made from gold have been found in Southeast Asia. Speculation among historians has resulted in many different hypotheses, which is as close as we may get to an accurate answer. Few archaeologists will even comment on it, because these objects aren't defined to a specific cultural area and therefore not their area of expertise. Even the theories that do exist are highly debated among historians. Can you figure out what this artifact is, or its purpose? If you can, then you may solve one of the most perplexing mysteries of our time. My daughter has been using ABC Mouse for two years. She learned to count to 20, she learned the alphabet, shapes, fight words, she's learning how to spell her own name all on ABC Mouse. She gets to decide the pace that she is progressing at, and Seraphina has chosen to go very rapidly. ABC Mouse instills this amazing, amazing knowledge, but it's so much fun. She loves learning, and I can't wait to see where it takes her. I've been telling everyone, the secret to great taste is having healthy gums. Keep yours healthy with Crest Advanced Gum Restore. It's clinically proven to detoxify below the gum line. And it restores by helping heal gums in as little as seven days. Because you can't have a healthy smile without healthy gums. Advanced Gum Restore from Crest, the number one toothpaste brand in America. At Chewy, we know the only thing that changes when bringing the food back is everything. And we're here with everything to help you on that journey. Or giving them something personal to so perfectly, no one has any idea how they were quarried and placed together. People are very creative and artistic, but to quarry a stone over 500 tons, move it, and put it into place where it fits perfectly, behooves even the most intelligent architect of today. Yet these walls exist all over the world, and no one knows how they were made or placed together. For example, consider the walls in Peru, Baalbek, and other ancient sites around the globe. Theories range from ancient giants that placed the stones to aliens with anti-gravity, magical talents some men had, to simple levers. 
Some believe the only way to get this precision would be to melt the stones into place. Today's builders and stone masons would have a hard time duplicating these artifacts, even with modern tools and technology. Some say it simply cannot be done. Who built these walls and how? Undiscovered predecessor made during the Hellenistic period. Its construction relies on theories of astronomy and mathematics developed by Greek astronomers during the second century BC, and it's estimated to have been built in the late second century BC or the early first century BC. It is the world's first known computer. A computer from the second century? Perhaps, but some believe the world's first computer. It was found in a shipwreck in 1900, along with statues and property, but no one knows if it is an older item that was along with the Greek pottery, or if it may be much older and was being transported with current items at the time. Scientists believe it was used to plot the movement of the sun, moon, and stars. Thus, it was a clock of sorts that could accurately predict upcoming astrological events and tell time. Some pieces of the clock have never been found, and it's possible there are more components of it buried in the shipwreck and lost forever. The scientists who have reconstructed the Antikytherian mechanism also agree that it was too sophisticated to have been a unique device, that there must be others. Of special delight to physicists, the moon mechanism uses a special train of bronze gears, two of them linked with a slightly offset axis to indicate the position and phase of the moon. As is known today from Kepler's law of planetary motion, the moon travels at different speeds as it orbits the Earth. And this speed differential is modeled by the Antikytherian mechanism. Even though the ancient Greeks were not aware of the actual elliptical shape of the orbit of the moon. If ancient computers existed 500 BC, Hooters. could other advanced technologies have existed in the ancient past? What if a modern jet plane were found in an ancient pyramid? It would, of course, be a major discovery. Man, dude, what are you, what are you doing? Oh, he's just going and still playing on that pewter. Oh, really? Yeah. Is this a helicopter? Is this a spaceship? A submarine or modern boat. The 3,000 year old hieroglyphs found in Satil's temple in Abydos, Egypt, are said to depict nothing less than a helicopter. Plane. And futuristic aircraft among the usual insects, symbols, and snakes. The writings have become known as the helicopter hieroglyphics among pseudoscience and conspiracy circles, with many supporters of the theory saying that if the ancient civilization was putting helicopters and modern spacecraft in their artwork, that they must have seen them, or at least pictures of them. And for that to have happened, someone from the future must have taken them back. 
Some have even taken the theory a step further, introducing aliens to the equation. The question remains, why would ancient Egyptians depict a modern helicopter above a doorway in a tomb? If it's not a helicopter, then what is it? Why is it there alongside of what appears to be a modern boat or submarine and a science fiction style spaceship? What did the Egyptians know 3,000 years ago? And if they knew about helicopters, what else could be hiding in undiscovered tombs across the African continent? Dropa stone. Dropa stones are said by some ufologists and pseudo-archaeologists to be a series of at least 716 circular stone discs dating back 12,000 years on which tiny hieroglyphic-like markings may be found. Each disc is claimed to measure up to one foot in diameter and carry two grooves, originating from a hole in their center in the form of a double spiral. The hieroglyphic-like markings are said to be found in these groups. No record has been found of the stones being displayed in any of the world's museums, and their current whereabouts are unknown. In 1962, a Chinese researcher, Sun Nui, was reported to have concluded that the grooves on the disks were actually very tiny hieroglyphs none of which were a pattern that had been seen before and which can only be seen with the use of a magnifying glass. He announced that he had deciphered them into a story that told of a spacecraft that crash landed in the area of the cave, the Bayan Har Mountains, and that the ship contained the Tropa people who could not fit in and therefore had to adapt to Earth. Further, his research claims that the Dropa people were hunted down and killed by the local Han Chinese for a period. Sun Nui noted specifically that one clip apparently said, The Dropa came down from the clouds in their aircraft. Our men, women, and children hid in caves ten times before sunrise. When at last we understood the sign language of the Dropas, we realized that the newcomers had peaceful intentions. Some who knew he is said to have published his findings in 1962 in a professional journal and was subsequently ridiculed and met with disbelief. Shortly afterwards, he said to have gone to Japan in a self-imposed exile where he died not long after he completed the manuscript of his work. The stones themselves seem to have disappeared. The stone discs were supposedly stored in various museums across China. However, none of these museums have any records or traces of Dropa stones ever being there. They obviously existed because there are photographs of them. What are these stone discs and where did they come from? Is the story they tell true? And if so, is there any proof other than the stones? The mysterious discovery was allegedly made in 1930 when Chi Pu Ti, an archaeology professor at Peking University, and his students were on an expedition to explore a series of caves in the inaccessible mountains near Tibet, which were supposedly carved artificially in a system of underground tunnels and pantries. According to these events, it said that Professor Chu P.T. and his students found tombs with skeletons of four to six feet in height buried inside them. The skeletons had abnormally large heads and small, thin, and fragile bodies. In addition to the skeletal remains, Professor Chu P.T. and his students discovered countless other items. After the studies on the Dropa stones, researchers turned their attention to the people in the area themselves. What happened to the Dropa? The cave area where the stones were located still had two tribes living in the vicinity, the Dropas and the Kongs. Archaeologists were called in to determine where the two tribes originated from, but were unable to relate either tribe to a known race. 
They also noticed that the people in these tribes had a very short average height and abnormally large heads and eye sockets. They were extremely thin characters with a very obvious yellow tinge to their skin color. Could these be the direct ancestors to the Dropa? Have you ever seen a Waffle Rock? There is one in Virginia and it's on display. Waffle Rock in America is a real geology puzzle because of the amazing patterns formed on its surface. Called Waffle Rock because it looks like a waffle iron grid, the question is, how was it made? Is it natural or the imprint of some advanced technological device that has long ago eroded and left its emboss on this natural rock? The Army Corps of Engineers and geologists say it's a natural formation, period. End of story. Nothing to see here. However, the scientific explanations don't account for all the features present in the rock. Aside from the unusual ancient alien talk, many believe that the pattern is actually an early form of hieroglyphic or primitive writing, and that the rock is the result of Neolithic art by pre-Columbian peoples. The rock on display at the West Virginia Outlook on Jennings Randolph Lake is but a small piece of the original rock. It was moved there to save the geologically significant piece of history from a dam project, likely in no small part because of pressure exerted by the original residents of Shaw, the town now? removed for the dam. No. Photographs of the whole rock show clearly the pattern well, or the structure of the pattern. Me out after I was done peeing. Rock, but rather can only be seen on one side. Most agree the rock is at least 250 million years old. It's either a perfectly natural formation, or the work of an old ancient civilization, or maybe even aliens. Aliens! Aliens! Oh no! And you never know if they're like the aboard. <laughs> No offense to Roblox, but do you know that you can trade a Galaxy in any year, any condition for a brand new, shiny, free Samsung Galaxy S22? That's how you can just swap things out of it. Yeah, and it turns out the new one's even better. With the same quirky charm. Come on, so where's the real Lily? What? Lily! Oh, what does that say? That's a name today. AT&T's Lily. Real Lily? Get a free Samsung Galaxy S22 with a Galaxy trade-in. Any year, any condition. Even in the madness of March. <laughs> She's too busy being a fat hoe. What makes Febreze air effects different? Well, cheaper aerosols rely on artificial propellants. Febreze uses a 100% natural propellant. Check it out. Pressure created by what's in your air makes the bottle spray, which means freshness everyone will love. Febreze. Imagine yourself in a new Toyota. Wow. Perfect. I think red is more me. Giddy up. Now get 2.49 APR financing on Adventurous New 22 RAV4 or the electrified 40 MPG RAV4 Hybrid. Plus, you get two years no cost maintenance. Ready, set, go get your Toyota today. Toyota, let's go places. Oh. Oh. Join Kirby on a brand new adventure. Get new copy abilities. And you Kirby, get a job right? mouthful of just dominate like never before. In Kirby and the Forgotten Land, only on Nintendo Switch. Game rated everyone, 10 and up. Well, I thought a fucking Nintendo died. Today, you can find just about any place with a quick Google search. But in times past, to get from here to there, you needed a map. 
Maps have been used to chart every point known around the globe. The more accurate, the better the map. And when trusting your life to the sea, you wanted the best map you could get. So when you went there, you didn't end up somewhere else. In 1513, a trip to the New World was all the rage. And accurate maps were needed to get to this newly founded land. Enter Peri Rhesus, a cartographer. Peri Rhesus served in the Turkish Navy, for which he held the rank of Admiral. He used 20 different maps and charts as his source documents to create what today is called the Peri Rhesus map. Eight of them were Palemtic maps, maps of the known world according to the second century Hellenistic or Greek society. Four were Portuguese maps. One was an Arabic map and one was drawn by Christopher Columbus himself. It was considered a very accurate map. But here is where the map gets weird. Along with depicting Africa, South America, and various islands accurately, it appears to show Antarctica with no ice caps. Antarctica as it would have looked over 6,000 years ago. Antarctica has been covered with ice for over 6,000 years, and no one has sailed around the planet before it froze over. So how could a map referenced from older maps have depicted the continent so accurately? Modern satellite mapping, which can peer through the ice, confirms the map is accurate. It correctly shows the outline of Antarctica as it is under the ice. Peri had referenced a map that displayed Antarctica correctly. So where did that map come from? Who would have known in 1513 that Antarctica is a continent and not just a huge landscape of ice? Who could have mapped it over 6,000 years ago when no one could see it and tell it was a continent? No one knows. It's a huge mystery. And now you have a new map to ponder over. If you take a tube of copper, a rod of iron, and put them in a clay pot filled with juice or some acidic liquid. Do you know what you get? A battery, that's what.